Hey, if you love Latina to Latina, and I know you do, and you want to support the show, it's as easy as listening on Radio Public, a free, super easy app that works on iPhone and Android. When you listen to Latina to Latina on Radio Public, we earn a little bit with every episode you hear. Thanks for listening and for loving the show. If there's injustice, what side are you going to take? I mean, there's no option. You have to be with your people. You have to defend your people. If there's corruption in the government, you have to confront the government, and you have to defend the people. You are on the side of the people. You will never be on the side of the oppressor. Ilia Calderon has made television history three times over as the first black woman to ever host a national news program in her native Colombia, as the first black anchor at Telemundo, and most recently at Univision, as the first Afro-Latina to lead an evening newscast for a major broadcast network in the U.S. But this trailblazer is not sitting on her laurels. Ilya is laser-focused on the here and now. Thank you for doing this. Oh, I am so glad, so glad to talk to you. Your career has been one of many firsts, and you make it all look easy. You make everything you do look easy. But being the first is never easy. It's never easy. But the way I see it, Alicia, is... It's hard to go through so many things that you have to go through to be here as a woman, as a Hispanic in the United States, as a black woman. But at the same time, it gives me the drive to think about others, to think about the new generations. So for me, this is big, but it's going to be bigger if I leave these doors open for someone else, for Mm -hmm. a minority that has to be here when I leave or before I leave this position, knowing that one day that is going to be the norm, knowing that one right. day that is not going to make big headlines when it happens. When Talk happens. to me about 2001 and making that leap from Colombia to the U.S. market, because I have to imagine that was the biggest leap you've made in your career. I was in Colombia working for CMA, one of the main newscasts, in prime time, I came to the United States on vacation and I wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> like other people come to Miami and they go to yeah. live in South Beach. No, you swung I, by Telemundo. <laughs> I wanted to go to Telemundo to see how the journalists that I used to see uh, work. So I went there through a friend that a friend that works there. They gave me a tour. And when I sat down with Maggie Van der Water, I want to mention her name because she was the one that changed everything. She told me, what do you do? I said, like, I'm a news anchor in Colombia. But why didn't you do the casting in Colombia? I said, like, what casting? Well, eight months ago, we went to Colombia, and we had a casting. We brought the main anchors in the country, and you were not there. I said, like, well, no one told me about a casting. Uh, She said, like, would you do a casting now? I said, like, of course. Then she called the vice president of news in Telemundo, and he told me, let's do a casting. What? I mean, yes, I've like heard people crazy. say right place, right time, but I don't know that I've ever heard a story like this That's before. it. He came, we did the casting the very same day. I was sitting with Deep Magnamara, the president of Telemundo, and he was offering me a job. <laughs> is there any part of you but, that's like, we got to pump the brakes. <laughs> this is all happening yeah, yeah. too fast. But you, but you know what? Like you just said, being at the right place at the right time, but at the same time, making decisions and not being afraid of making right. big decisions. Right. I had a relationship in Colombia for two years. Like a romantic my boyfriend, relationship? Uh, yeah, my, my boyfriend. And we were in a serious relationship. Not engaged, but in a serious relationship. And when this opportunity opened for me, I said, like, I'm, I mean. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye everything. <laughs> Bye everything. I had my mom and my sisters by my side. He understood, of course. He was not going to ask me to stay. I was not going to ask him to come with me because he had his own career there. So in those terms, everybody was good. You know, sometimes when you see those big opportunities come to you, you have to say yes. You have to to leave all the fears behind and see this is mine. It just happened for a reason and I have to take it. What is the most difficult story you have ever covered? So many. But I think for what it meant to me as a woman as a Hispanic, as a black Hispanic, and as a mother, when I interviewed Chris Barker, the KKK. Mm -hmm. Um, When we were talking about what was going on with the KKK, they were not covering their faces anymore, not wearing the the garments and and the hoods. They were free to insult and free to attack. 
that's the way they were feeling, empowered by the highest position of the government, right? Oh. I said, I wanted to cover the story. He really? said, like, are you sure? I said, like, yes, I want to look at hate face to face and ask him why does he hate us? What have we done to deserve this? To me, you're a nigger. That's it. I find, I, that, I, I find that offensive. When you look at me, what do you see? I'm upset that I've seen you. I've been here over 20 years, and we've never had a black person or whatever you want to call yourself, your mom would have made I am a black person. Yeah, black family. Yeah. Yes. He's mining him. Whatever. But we've never had one. We don't let them around. Yeah. Are you going to chase me out of here? No, we're going to burn you out. Are like you going to burn me out? How are you going to do it? How are you going to do with 11 million immigrants? I was watching the clip, and you do not seem scared. Well, I was. <laughs> okay. So what would you tell yourself in those moments where you were scared or were going to have an emotional response to what he was saying? I mean, because he not only called you names, but he threatened you. Yes. Because when I was sitting there, I was sitting as a journalist, mm -hmm. and I had a job to be done. Yep. As a person, I felt insulted, of course. But I was sitting there as a journalist, and I just did my job. So you separate? I separate myself, like two Ilias there. How about when you cover a story like the immigrant caravan? It's hard. And I, I always try to see the stories from the perspective of the child, the children. How do they feel? That tells you a lot. Right. Because adults are the ones that make the decision. Right. The kids, they don't know. They just come with their right. parents, and they... What do they think about the United States? What do you think you're going to find in the United States? Right. Is, is it, that's a completely another world. I remember I did a story in El Salvador at a repatriation center, and I met a little boy who told me, well, in the United States, only a crazy person will kill you here. Anybody can do it. Yes. And I was like, well, that's not a person who's been trained. Like, mm -hmm. this is from the it's, mouth of babes. It's natural. It's natural. And it's hard to see um, families that are leaving behind everything. 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 Just to to find peace, to find a future for their kids. And and they are doing it legally. They are free to seek asylum mm -hmm. and they are free to to seek refuge. Uh, they are not doing anything against the law. Is there a part of you that when you get to get on a plane and come home to your own daughter feels a little guilty? I used to until one day that I went to cover uh, the earthquake in Mexico mm -hmm. and I was sent back home and the very same day or the next day I had to go to Puerto Rico because of the Hurricane Maria. And I was crying because I just unpacked and packed again. And I was like, Mayana, you know, so many things happening in the world. I'm traveling so much. I hugged her and I started crying. And she hugged me back and said, Mami, estoy bien, me dijo. Mami, estoy, todo va a estar bien. And then I felt like she was ready. She was, like, every night that I talked to her about what Mami does, mm -hmm. about about Mami's work, she gets it. Okay. She gets it. And one day when she saw me that I was breaking, that I was, you know, breaking up, and I was crying, and I was sad, she was the one that gave me comfort and said, like, it, you know, everything's going to be okay. Hey, since you like our show, I want to take a minute to tell you about something new and exciting. Think about all the people you know, then all the people that they know. All of those relationships form a complicated, interconnected web. Wonder Media Network's brand new show, Web of Women, dives into what makes us who we are as individuals and communities. The host, Jenny Kaplan, starts things off by interviewing four women she knows from different parts of her life. Then each of those women picks someone to interview, and so on. They talk about politics, gender, religion, and other facets of identity. Web of Women is a new kind of podcast that illuminates the intersection of relationships, identity, and community. Check out and subscribe to Web of Women, spelled W-M-N, wherever you listen to podcasts. You come from a small town in Colombia, El Choco. What do you remember most about growing up? I was a happy girl. We didn't have much, but I was happy. We didn't have power when I was a child. I remember we used to have a green refrigerator that only worked three days a week. When we had power from a generator that a neighbor was so kind to, you know, attach to our house three days a week. So those days, 
is when I saw and tasted ice for the first time. Ice cream. My mom used to make juices, fruit juices, and then put them in the freezer. And those were our popsicles, you know, from natural fruits. Mm -hmm. And yet at 10 years old, you go to your mother and say, I want to go to school in Medellin. In Medellin. What did your little 10-year-old brain see for yourself in that bigger city? I was happy, but I felt that I needed something else. My heart told me that I was ready for bigger things in mm -hmm. my life. And and I told my mother that I want to go to Medellin to study. I said, like, are you crazy? Like, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to live with my, I can live with your sister, my auntie. And that's it. Uh, I've met your mother, Betty, a number of times, and she's one of my favorite people. Like I remember when we were at the Unidos conference mm -hmm. and you were giving the keynote, you introduced her and she stood up and she gave like her best Miss Universe wave yes, to the room and the, the room <laughs> roared for her and she was like ready to take it all. What role has she played in your success? She, she is everything. Yep. I learned everything from her. Determination, respect, loyalty. She's a fighter. Mm -hmm. She's a fighter. She divorced my father when I was 14 to 15 years old, and she raised us up by herself. We are all professionals. My sister is a dentist. The other sister is a teacher, and she did it by herself, by herself. I remember the story that she told me about when she was pregnant with me. She was 28, and her mother and her sister died on a plane crash. They, were, they went to Medellin to buy everything for me, that I was the first baby in the house. My mom is the, the, the oldest daughter. And they were so happy, you know, she was pregnant, and then the first niece, and, and they died. And then my mom assumed the role of the mother in the house, and she worked so hard until the little brother graduated from the engineer school, and she started going to, school, to college. And she started studying language. Can you imagine experiencing the greatest grief of your life at the moment that you're experiencing the greatest joy? That no. seems so it's, it's, profoundly it's, it's, unfair. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Have her in my life. I'm, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. El Choco, my understanding, largely black community. Yes. So then when you go to Medellin, mm -hmm. It's the first place you experienced discrimination. Do you remember what that looked like? I do. I was 11 years old or 12, um, going to the morning assembly. And then I passed by a bigger girl. She was probably graduating that year. And she said, black, not even my horse. And Does that make any more sense in Spanish than it makes in English? Negro ni mi caballo. No, that, that, it's just the rude. same thing. Like it just it was it was just rude. Like I don't want anything black around me, something like that. And I looked at her and she was like, you know, with that, you know, attitude of disrespecting. And I didn't say anything. And I decided just to to let it go. I just kept it by myself for myself. I didn't say anything. I didn't say much because it was more like Okay, I just leave it behind. It's their mistake, not mine. There's nothing wrong with me. I knew it. My mommy told me. There's nothing wrong with me. It's, something is wrong is with them. But the first time that Anna came home telling me someone called her blackface at four years old, I almost died. And then all those memories came back. Mm. I said, like, I cannot teach my daughter to be silent. It worked for me, and it worked perfect. And I'm okay. But I cannot, I cannot teach her the same. So what did so you tell her needs, to do? She needs to speak up for herself and always with respect, always understanding that sh there's nothing wrong with her. But she has the right to speak up and say, there's nothing wrong with me. Don't be mean. You know, isn't she's only six. Mm -hmm. I cannot teach her more than, <laughs> <laughs> more than that. You'll teach her a different saying, language yeah, in the exactly. future. <laughs> exactly. She knows. She knows. You've also addressed this publicly in 2015 when Univision host Rodner Figueroa was fired for comparing Michelle Obama's appearance to someone from the cast of Planet of the Apes. You published a beautiful public letter to Anna and you talked about the discrimination that she would face in part because she's Asian and Latina and dark skinned. Yes. Right. So she's dealing with 
a triumvirate yes. of biases. Why did you want to address it in such a public forum? Um, that week, something else happened to my nephew in New Zealand. My sister lives in New Zealand. And Samuel told my sister, Mommy, I don't want to be brown. Because at school they told me that brown people is bad people. It was just, I, I just had it inside that I needed to write. And then I just started like just so naturally writing a letter to Ana. And then I called Enrique Acevedo. I said like, what do you think about this? And he told me, you have to publish it. And I did it like so naturally <laughs> that day, not knowing that it was going to create animosity in some people. But it was a question that I had to myself. Like, why do I have to teach my daughter? Two years after, I knew I was right. You also, though, in that piece, and this is perhaps the the hardest piece of it to write, is you called out racism in our own families. That this is not just something that exists outside of Latino families. It can very much exist in your own family. Alicia, when the grandmother says, like, oh, you have a bad hair, you know, because you have curly hair. Or the other one is, like, you know, the favorite is the nephew with the lighter skin. It happens. It happened when when we disrespect the Indian communities, the black communities in our countries. And everybody thinks that that is correct because it has been done forever and now is the norm. When are we going to cut that circle? When are we going to stop? Because it hurts people. It's funny that often because Univision sees itself as serving a community, it gets labeled as advocacy journalism. But that service piece is really what drives it. Yes. And there's a difference. It is a difference. I mean, nowadays, if there's injustice, thank God for journalism. Mm -hmm. And what side are you going to take? Sometimes there's no, I mean, there's no option. You have, you have to be with your people. You have to, if there's injustice, you have to defend your people. If there's corruption in the government, you have to confront the government. And you have to defend the people. That is not taking any side. That you are on the side of the people. You are, you will never be on the side of the oppressor. Never. As Desmond Tutu said, never on the side of the oppressor. When I first started doing this and I would talk about climate change, it was like another subject, like geology, hydrology, meteorology, and it was well received. And then at some point it got politicized. What made climate change political was the most comprehensive, longest-running propaganda campaign in U.S. history. I'm Amy Westervelt, the host of Drilled, a true crime podcast about climate change. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You're graciously doing this interview in English with me today because my Spanish is not so good looking, but it's a thing you have to do frequently, which is to go between... English and Spanish. I mean, if you're in my in house, a, I'm a mother in yeah, Spanish right. and, and a wife right. in English. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, if you're in a pool, if you're doing something like that KKK interview, I mean, you do have to be able to operate in both. And that's not just a linguistic thing. That's also a code switch, right? It's an ability to know whom you're talking to and what they require of you linguistically and culturally. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it, and it's not easy because I I came to this country and didn't know anything about the language. I had to learn English here when I moved here. Really? Yes. I was 28 years old. What did you do? I went to Miami-Dade College. Mm. English is a second language. And why did you know you had to learn English given that you were working at a Spanish language television station? This is the United States and my boss at the time didn't speak Spanish. Joe Pernin was an American <laughs> guy. So basically, <laughs> to communicate with him. <laughs> I needed to do it. He's he's an amazing journalist. He understands uh, the, la- the Hispanic community. He understands the problematic. He understands the immigration issues that we have. And he really feels like when you talk to him, he's like if you were talking to a Hispanic journalist that doesn't speak Spanish. Do you think overall that the American journalistic institutions see Spanish language outlets as being equals or do they see them as being marginalized or on the fringes? I think things have changed Mm -hmm. before it was like that. But now the fact that they are hiring more Hispanics 
and they listen to the perspective of those employees. When you see the immigration topic, taking it seriously, it's a lot to be done, but things mm -hmm. are changing. I mean, except the end, like the World Cup, where everyone all of a sudden gets that it's like there's one place people watch the World Cup. Uh, only <laughs> Do you know how distracting it was trying to work in that newsroom <laughs> in the middle of the World Cup? Yes. Yes, yes. Like, everybody's engaged. Shh. Everybody is engaged. I That's actually, the, I don't know how the production goes on. We have it in our blood. Like, soccer, we have it in our blood. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, I think <clears throat> one of the things I was most surprised by when I was working at Fusion and I was in proximity to Univision was... Spanish language news is glamorous in a way that English language news is just not. <laughs> and I mean that in a few ways. When you all look so good, you dress so well, you show up on red carpets, you're in people in Espanol. And the audience clearly responds to that and mandates that. And yet I wonder how you reconcile that desire for aspiration against the realities of serving a community that we all know is, is often struggling. Well, in, in a way, when you say that they they like that glamour and stuff, it's if you see it in a good way, it's a way to be closer to them. Yes. It's, it's definitely a way I to, understand to belong before. to their family, to like the same person that, you know, reads the news to you every day that tells you what's going on in the world is the same person that is on the red carpet close to you and is the same person that you see in the supermarket. Is that part of the way, too, you think about your social media presence? Yes, definitely. Giving definitely. them access. Yes. And I, too, like, I separate, like, my Instagram account, for example, is more personal, and people love it. When I post something about my daughter and my husband or the three of us together, no, they love it. Let's they, talk they about go, the fact that Anna's Instagram account has three times as many <laughs> followings as my own. <laughs> Just like... <laughs> Yes, she's they love Anna. They love Anna, and they, and they love the fact that she's a normal kid. You've already accomplished so much; like you could really ride Not off yet. into the sunset. <laughs> Not yet. No, I know. No, no, no. Yes. it's, it's a lot more to do. to do. I want to see more minorities. So tell me and, about that. Tell me about what it is, because I think it would be easy to see this as the top of the top. You got the thing you came for. This is it. So what? What it's more not, do you want? It's not me. It's not only being a role model for others, but trying to work in the community to deliver the message and empower them. I have one place, one um, a summit that I go. It's called One Young World because investing in young people is the best way you can invest any effort. And if they are already compromised with any cost, Call education, LGBTQI, the environment, climate change. You are investing in in something that you can see results uh, soon. So I go there, I talk to them, I address some issues, and people from all over the world come to One Your World. On the phone, I met this girl from Chocó. In 2017, One Young World was in Colombia, and I couldn't go because of Mexico and Puerto Rico and all the hurricane season. So I had to cancel. She went there, and then the next year, in 2018, was in The Hague, in the Netherlands. And she won a ticket to go to the Netherlands, but she couldn't go because she didn't have money. She's from Chocó. So this year, Jeanette is coming to London with me. And when you come from a small town where corruption is taking every penny, Alicia, I've seen my friends from my childhood going to jail because, as my mom did, their moms worked hard to give them the opportunity to study, to go to college in a big city. They didn't went, they went back to Chocó just to take the little bit that we have left. So when you see a young lady working already in projects with young people and doing something for education and for health, as you cannot do anything else but, but you know, but help help her to be in contact with the right people, to listen to the right conversation, to be in touch with other projects in the world. So she goes back 
and works for our community, work for our community. If your 10 year old self who had the wherewithal to say, the world is bigger than this, I need a better education than I can get right here. If she could see everything that you have right now, what would she think? That little girl, hmm. probably you know everything that that little girl had inside and working hard for, yeah, it was worth it. Even though, despite all the odds, despite all the bad situations and the bad experience, when I look back and I see it, it, it is totally worth it. Leah, thank you so much. No, thank you, Alicia. Thanks for joining us today. Latina to Latina was originally co-created with Bustle, now the podcast is owned and executive produced by Juleka Lentigua-Williams and me. Maria Muriel was the sound designer on this episode. We want to hear from you. Tell us who you want to hear from and how you're making the show a part of your life. Email us at hola at latinatolatina.com. Remember to subscribe or follow us on Radio Public, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening. <laughs>